Whether you're a lifelong Catholic, a new Catholic, or somebody who's looking into the Catholic faith, saying yes to Christ, yes to God, yes to the Catholic faith, the Catholic Church, has life-changing implications. And saying yes day after day, after day, to what God wants for us, where God's leading us, where He's taking us, that openness, that docility to the Holy Spirit, to, to God's leading, is life-changing. This week, I am joined by David Patterson from the wildly popular Yes Catholic Instagram channel to talk about what that means. And first of all, to tell his remarkable story and then dig into more stories, other people, other experiences, other things that happen when you say yes to God, yes to the Catholic Church. We talk about the Eucharist adoration, reconciliation, and unpack some amazing experiences that David's had and David's heard about as well. And gosh, why, when, and what's underneath of you saying yes? Yes to the Catholic Church, yes to Christ, yes to following God wholeheartedly wherever he leads. This is an amazing story, amazing conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Hey friends, welcome back to the show. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. If you're listening on podcast, thank you. Subscribe and follow the show if you can. Leave a rating and a review uh, wherever you listen to it. If you can do that as well, that helps to push the podcast out to new people. And if you're watching on YouTube, thank you. Hey, welcome and subscribe to the channel as well. Leave some comments, interact. It's always fun and crazy and, and wild out there in the world of YouTube. So thanks for uh, watching and definitely uh, let us know what you think of these kind of conversations. I am joined this week for an awesome uh, conversation with David. Patterson. He is the founder and host of Yes Catholic, a phenomenal uh, ministry initiative on Instagram. I love his stuff. Followed him for a while. I'm thrilled to have you on the show, David. Thank you for being here. Welcome and hello. Thank you so much for having me. Really excited to have this conversation, man. Yeah, I think it'll be a lot of fun. And I, I would be reticent to not mention uh, how I first met you because I talk a lot on the show when I tell a bit of my story of, of one of my very good friends um, who was kind of the guy who got me uh, into Christianity. I guess mm -hmm. in the beginning, right? It was, it was his witness. So a friend of mine uh, that I know, I've known forever, forever, a while back, a few years ago, probably before pre, pre-COVID, I think, actually, it feels like different lifetime, uh, David, but said, hey, I met this guy at a cool alpha retreat. Uh, you got to meet him. He's a Catholic. He's on fire for his faith. And this friend of mine is not Catholic. He's evangelical. He got me, he got me started my start in Christianity. Right. I kept going and became Catholic. He's yet to follow. I, I'm, I'm praying for him. I'm, I'm praying for you, bud, if you're watching. <laughs> but he introduced me to you, and I thought, wow, this is an awesome guy. And I followed you ever, ever since in your awesome ministry. And I want to talk a bit more later on in, in the show about why I think what you do is so important and amazing for people in, in, in the audience of, of this show in particular. Mm -hmm. But I want to begin by acknowledging that. Thank you, Brent, wherever you may be. I know where he is. He's, he's not dead. It sounds like he's dead or something. He's not dead, David. He's a good guy. He's still living. He's still breathing. He's a good man. He's a good man. More <laughs> Anyway, uh, tangent upon tangents. I want to, first of all, before we get into what you do in your ministry, I think I want to talk about first about your, your own story because it's a fascinating story. And I think it really, I mean, I see why the genesis of your, of your ministry comes from your story because you're... Your story is about beginning to take your faith more seriously like, and making a commitment to to practice your faith and, and carry out your faith and, and be Catholic. Mm -hmm. And your ministry is is showcasing, uh, uh, showing stories like like that, people who are saying like, yeah, yeah, I'm Catholic. Here's why. Here's why right. I, I, I love it. So let me just back off a little bit and, and take us through your story maybe and then how you got started d doing this afterwards. And then we'll dig into some things afterwards. But first of all, I will... Be quiet. Sorry, listeners. I'll be quiet now. Uh, tell us your faith journey. It, it, it's a good one. I, I, want to, I want to hear more. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I was raised as a cradle Catholic going to Mass every single Sunday. was asked to be an altar server as a, as a young boy, uh, but very much going through the motions of, of being a Catholic, not really knowing what I was receiving in the Eucharist, just very much going through the motions. Um, but I remember grade seven, actually, the priest approached me. We were very well known in our ch church community because my mom actually sang at mass every single Sunday. Uh, and the priest approached me in grade seven and said, David, I, I think you should read at mass. And I was kind of like, who, me? Yeah. 
and I was super nervous, but he taught me how to read in front of everyone. And the next week, um, I ended up going to the sacristy and I met this young girl, uh, Megan, who was also uh, reading that mass. And she really just encouraged me in that moment and said, you're going to be really, really great. Um, and it did go well, but fast forward into high school, I had a lot of questions about my faith. And I feel like these became roadblocks where I would kind of go to my mom and I kind of say like, mom, I just don't understand this. You know, I have all these questions and I'm pretty sure she handed me like this Catholic book. And she's like, just read this. And <laughs> I just, I was interested. I'd rather play uh, Sega Genesis at the time. Right. Um, and so these questions just continued to build and I really very much wanted to belong in high school, you know? And so I thought, you know, maybe if I just do these things like the drinking and the smoking and all that, then I'll finally be one of them, you know? And so, um, I got involved in, in the drinking and the partying and it was really, I believe in grade 10 that I kind of was driving with my mom one night and I just said, mom, I know that you're into the Catholic church stuff, but I don't know if it's for me anymore. And I basically said to her that I think I'm done, you know, like I don't even, and she's like, what do you mean? Like, we can go talk to the priest. We can, we can work through this. And I said, no, like, I, I think like I'm done with this. And that really much kind of set me on this course of just leaving my faith. Um, fast forward, went to uh, university, uh, attended a business program and the partying rather than just going out on Fridays and Saturdays, drinking with my friends, uh, it escalated to Wednesdays throughout the week, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays. I could tell you what club I went to on what night of the week. Um, but I was very much trying to fill this deeper void that was obviously not being fulfilled. And it was my second year of university that my mom randomly calls me. I'm pretty sure I was hungover one morning when I woke up and she said, David, are you sitting down? And I said, yeah, why? And she said, you know, your friend Megan from church. And I said, yeah. She said she was in a tragic car accident. She died. And I remember just in that moment, just I didn't know how to process it, you know, because I was very much living in my own bubble. I was very selfish um, that I didn't go to class that day. I just sat in my room so numb. I didn't move. And I know that a lot of people in our church really shook our church to the core. Like a lot of people asked, like, if God is so good, why would they, why would he take our friend from us? Yeah. A lot of pain there. Um, and so I continued, you know, going out with my friends. But it was my third year of university, my third year of university, where my mom found out about this Catholic retreat for uh, high school university students. And so she calls me and she kind of thinks that this could be, you know, a potential moment for me. So she calls me. I'm at university. She says, David, there's this Catholic retreat. You should go. And I was kind of like, sounds kind of lame, you know, but she just was <laughs> not giving up. She just kept asking me over and over and over again, Catholic retreat. I finally answered and I just said, mom, if you stop bugging me, I'll go. She was so happy. She's like, okay, you know? And so we're on our way to this retreat and my buddies found out. I started getting all these text messages being like, dude, I heard you go on this weird retreat. I'll come pick you up. Let's go get drunk. Let's party. I was in the parking lot. Okay. Of this retreat that's about to begin. I'm yelling at my mom in the parking lot. She's crying. I'm swearing at her. Like I was just not in a good place at that point. I was a lot of anger, a lot of anger. And she said, she basically yelled at me in that moment. <laughs> like I was a little boy. And she said, David, you know exactly who doesn't want you to be here right now. So what are you talking about? And she said, the devil, oh. the devil wants to destroy you. She's like, wake up. And it kind of freaked me out when she said that to me, I'm going to be completely honest. Like it kind of stopped me in my tracks. And right when she said that to me, uh, this priest approached me, turned around and he was standing right there and, and he was wearing a cowboy hat of all things. Right. <laughs> <laughs> which is, which is hilarious. And he basically said, is everything okay? And I said, no, like, I think I'm, I'm going to be leaving. And he just talked me right down and nearing the end of the conversation, squared me up, looked me right in the eyes and said, son, I think you need to stay. And I said, okay, I'll stay. I text my buddies. I said, don't come get me. I'm staying. And they're like, say what? <laughs> and I attended this retreat and the speaker, uh, his name was Joe Ferris. He's from the U S and he spoke as if I was the only person in that room. Uh, and he actually, the theme was very much on giving your yes to Jesus. And he said, today is August 15th, 2009. You have the opportunity to be free today. And it begins with saying that yes to Christ, the assumption of our lady. And, you know, I had a lot of questions 
about the Catholic faith. And so I was sitting there. I was kind of like, okay, Joe, I hear what you're saying about this Catholic faith stuff and saying yes, but I got my questions. And I was sitting there not saying anything, right? And I said, why? what's the deal with like Catholics and Mary? Like, why, why do Catholics worship Mary, right? It's like a common thing that someone will throw out there. And he would just bring it up in that moment. He goes, oh, guys, we got to talk about something. You know how they say like Catholics worship Mary and he explained how we don't. And I was kind of like, okay, that was freaky. He just read my mind. And I was like, okay, Joe, that was funny. Like, what about statues? You know, and he goes, oh, and you know how they talk about statues. And I was like, okay, this is, this is too much for me. Right. And he said, August 15th, 2009, say yes to picking up your cross and following Christ. And he gave us this opportunity to give that yes, to go to confession. And I just kind of had this moment of reflecting on the path that I was on. And it was very much a path of destruction. I was so unhappy. I was miserable. I was trying to fill these voids with just like these empty wells, you know, like alcohol does not satisfy. It's like, it's a depressant, right? It makes you feel worse, but you just keep going for more and more. And so I had this moment of, I can't go back to it. I can't go back to this. I have to, I, I want to, I want to change. And I gave that yes. And I prayed with all my heart and I ran to confession and man, I sat down and I said to the priest, I said, father, we're going to be here a long time <laughs> for confession. I feel bad for him. He was a, he was a baby priest. He was newly ordained to the priesthood. His ordination was in May and his retreat is in August and he gets me. God bless. Right. <laughs> but as I unloaded all those years, of, of yeah. sins and baggage, the weight that was just lifted off of me, man, I can't even describe. And that evening was Eucharistic adoration. And being a cradle Catholic, you'd think that I would have experienced Eucharistic adoration, but that was actually the very first time I ever experienced adoration. And I was on my knees and I looked over and Joe was actually kneeling very close to me. And I saw the way that he looked at Jesus in the Eucharist. And in that moment, I just knew that Jesus was among us. And this peace that I experienced was was life-changing and so basically uh i didn't want to leave this retreat because i had to go back to university for my fourth year and i was terrified because i knew i needed to change and so i basically started going to mass by myself went back to university i had no one to go with and went by myself to church every single sunday and I like to say the drinking and the partying just stopped after this experience, but it was very much about picking up my cross and falling down and, and getting back up and continuing that process. And I remember I would go to the priest where I was going to university and I said, father, like I got drunk again. And he's like, why can't you just have a pop man? Like, and I was just saying like, that's not cool. You know, and just like, we'd have these little debates in the confessional, but I just kept believing that God was going to heal me, that he was going to set me free of these chains that were in my life. And basically within six months of going to the sacrament of reconciliation, receiving the Eucharist, um, God healed me. I haven't been drunk since. Um, he very much broke that chain in my life. Thanks be to God. And um, around that time, my mom found out about another conference called Lift Jesus Higher Rally Downtown Toronto. So she calls me and she says, do you want to go? And I was, I was going to be graduating from university my fourth year very soon. So I was like, yeah, you know, like I've experienced how God has moved in my life. I want to go. And so I'm at this conference and there was this Eucharistic procession and I was on my knees and I was saying, God, like, I don't know what you want me to do. If you want me to be a missionary, I'll do it. Like wherever you want me to go, I just say yes. And God did not want me to go uh, out of Canada <laughs> because when I was on my knees praying, I had this image of the basement of my old church in Bowmanville, Ontario, tons of <laughs> teens praising God. I just had this image of their hands lifted high, just worshiping the father. And I had no idea what it meant, but my mom took me in the church the next day after the conference. And I went up to the priest and I said, father, uh, I was at this conference. I have no idea what this means, but yesterday I had this image when I was praying of like tons of teens in the basement of this church. What do you think it means? And he looked at me like a deer in the headlights and he said, okay, that's, that's crazy because yesterday we had a meeting as a church talking about looking for a full-time youth minister. <laughs> I think you could be him. Whew. And I was like, but you need backup. <laughs> <laughs> because if you knew where I've been, if you knew what I've done, you would not be asking me to be this youth minister. And he said, pray about it. And so I graduated from university and I did feel called to 
to basically become this youth minister. And I had no idea what I, what I was doing at all. I had no experience working with youth. It's really pathetic how I started the youth group. I basically Googled youth group, the pictures that came up on Google, I printed them in color. I put them on a poster board and at the ministry fair, teens started coming up to me and they said, Hey, what's this? And I said, we're starting a youth group. And they said, what are we going to do? And I honestly said, I have no idea, but it's going to be fun. Hope you can make it. (laughs) First week we had seven within uh, another week. We went from seven to 50. That's amazing. And the priest said to me, he said, you got to go to the high school. And you got to promote your program. And what's so crazy is that was my old high school. <laughs> I spent my high school career denying my faith and not living it. And I give my yes to God and God sends me back to my old high school to stand before all of my teachers. I had to do class presentations and say, <laughs> hey, I'm the youth minister. Hope you can come and check out our program. And this is where it gets really wild. Okay, And it's very much connected to the story of Yes Catholic. So I'm going to continue with this. Basically, I go and do these class presentations, okay? And after visiting the entire school and all the classes, one student shows up to my program (laughs) the next night, okay? And his name was Matthew. He was very quiet. He was very reserved, very much kept to himself. But he kept showing up. And I was thinking, what's this kid's deal? Like, he doesn't talk to me, right? But we were going to be attending a retreat that was going to be happening with Net Ministries of Canada, And so I said, Matthew, like, you should go to this retreat. And he said, I can't. I got lacrosse practice and I got football practice that day. I can't go. And I was like, well, that's a bummer, right? But something put on my heart. Send a last call email. Last call, we're going on this retreat, the morning of the retreat. So what I didn't realize, his mom told me later, was that that morning of the retreat, first email she received was football practice canceled. Second email that came in was lacrosse practice canceled. Third email that came in was my email that said last call (laughs) retreat. I'm telling you right now, God wanted Matthew at this retreat. And so the whole retreat was about God's love and Matthew ended up attending and how there's nothing you can do to make God love you less. And it was incredible. There was adoration and prayer ministry and testimonies and skits and an amazing day. Um, honestly, I've been in youth ministry for 12 years and I wish I could take every single teen on this retreat because it was amazing. (laughs) But at the end, there was a time of open mic and they said, if anyone, um, wants to share how God's been able to move in their life, we're going to do an open mic right now. You can come up to the front, you can stand and you can share how God's been able to move. And, uh, there's this awkward silence as some retreats tend to have at times. And all of a sudden, Matthew stands up and he heads to the front. And I was thinking like, he barely talked to me at the programs and he's going to now speak in front of like 50 people. But he took the microphone and he was shaking. And he said, I've never really spoken about this. But when I was 10 years old, my sister was in a tragic car accident and she died. And I was sitting there and I had this moment of, <laughs> oh my goodness, Megan. Wow. My friend, it was his sister. (laughs) So Matthew is now on retreat with me. (laughs) And when I had that realization of what God was doing, I could not hold back the tears. Like they were just, (laughs) tears were just pouring. And uh, he said, I locked myself in my room playing video games when my sister died, just trying to numb the pain because I thought that God like abandoned our family that we were alone, but because of this retreat, I know that God was with me. And he said, I just want to thank you so much because I feel like my heart is beating again for the first time after all these years. Matthew like totally broke out of his shell. He became one of my best leaders in the youth group. The way he interacted with the the great six, seven, eights was just incredible. I still keep in contact with him today. He's an incredible man. Had him on the show as well to share his story. And his dad that year messaged me and said, I just want to thank you so much because um, we finally have our son back after all these years. And his dad ended up going on this business trip and he he went to Mexico and ended up purchasing me this image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. He said, I just felt called to give this to you. Fast forward, this is where Yes Catholics is coming in and how it, it kind of came to be. Fast forward 2019, okay? I'm on a retreat and this teen walks in who was just angry. He was in my small group, didn't want to be there. And something just put on my heart to talk to him. 
basically like at the end of all the activities, uh, let's just have a man to man talk. And something told me, share the story of Matthew and Megan, right? I sat him down. I said, listen, I don't know what's going on with you. Just feel called to share the story. And after sharing the exact same story I shared with you just now, I said, so buddy, like, why are you so angry? And he said, I can't believe you just told me that story. And I said, why? And he said, because when I was 10 years old, my sister died and I'm so angry at God. And I just had this moment of like, wow, you know, like that, that was once again, God moving. And the next day was a time of confession. He calls me over and says, Hey, can you please pray for me right now that I will go to confession and make my peace with God. And I just prayed for him and he went to confession and he walked out healed. And he said, I'm never going to forget this moment. Thank you. And I was just so overwhelmed by the power of story. You know, like I didn't, I didn't give a Bible study. I didn't give a catechism lesson, which I think is very important, but I simply shared another story of someone encountering God. And so two weeks later, this is where Yes Catholic is coming in. I was on my way to work and I was saying my usual yes to God as I'm on my way to work at the high school. And Yes Catholic hit me. And then a week later, it was actually on the feast day of Our Lady Guadalupe, which I didn't even realize, December 12th. I actually pulled my car over so I could voice record real people, real stories, all grace. And that's where Yes Catholic really came to be. <laughs> David, <laughs> those are... That's crazy. <laughs> Those are crazy stories. <laughs> That's amazing. I'm, I'm glad that listeners who are listening can't see me beginning to cry as you are telling these emotional stories. YouTube guys, I'm sorry. It's, <laughs> but it's amazing. Like that's, gosh, the way that those things work out and, and intertwine. And I mean, wow. <laughs> That's amazing. And I love your mom also. I got to say, she seems amazing. <laughs> She's like my biggest fan. If you actually pay attention to the comments on Instagram live, you'll see her like commenting. <laughs> that's it's like, hi, mom. <laughs> that's that's yeah. amazing. I love that. I mean, gosh, there's so much to unpack in there just in, in your own story. But the way that, you know, and we get these glimpses sometimes, right? You know this. Glimpses sometimes of, of, of how our, our lives are unfolding when we say yes. Right when we follow that that path that God is laying before us, when we cooperate with with His grace, right, we occasionally get those glimpses like that into how the whole thing is fitting together. I mean, we'll know this at the end of our lives when we yes. see Him face to face. But gosh, the glimpses that, that you get, like in this story, you know, I've, I've had some of these in, in my life as well. It's amazing to see how those things line up. Like there you are with the brother of that girl who is so impactful at the beginning of your story there, right? That, that, that's, you can't orchestrate that. <laughs> that's like, right. that's the plot of a very good, very good movie, right? You can't, you, you can't plan that. That's amazing. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it's, it's so amazing how even, you know, I've had the opportunity, thanks be to God, to share my story for years, but it's amazing how our stories have so many layers Yeah, and even how we don't even realize the significance of God moving. I'll give you one example. The cowboy hat with the priest showing up. My grandfather actually wore a cowboy hat all the time. He was really into country music. He played the fiddle. And he was an image of fatherhood to me. And so what's so crazy is I think it was just a year ago where I was on a podcast. And I think it was Rachel from um, Good to Grow. She just said, what's the deal with the cowboy hat? And I had this, I had this moment of, oh my goodness, God sent an image of fatherhood. Like, yes, in the priesthood, but also in that image of what I would know to cause me to stay. He's in the details. Yeah. Yeah. And you, and you listen for that, right? You look for that. I think that's so important, right? I mean, that's, I want to get into, I mean, part, part of what I love that you do, right, is that you bring these stories like your own story of people saying yes to, to God, yes, Jesus, yes, to the Catholic faith, the Catholic church, yes, to pursuing this, this calling, right? And for me, for somebody who, 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 with this podcast, I want to bring voices for people who are looking into the Catholic faith, who are, who are mm -hmm. new Catholics. And I, 
so often, one of the number one things that I that I get from people who are looking into the faith and ask questions and have questions, apart from issues with Mary and struggles with the, with the saints and these those typical things, right? That you also had, in, in that again, again, an amazing psychic interaction with this with the speaker. I mean, that's like you know, from from your brain to God to His lips, like this cool triangle of like grace <laughs> flowing there. But apart from questions like that, I get. I get emails from people who go, look, I love I love what I've read about the faith. I love the videos I've watched the faith. I love hearing from guests on your show, but I don't know any Catholics who take their faith seriously. The Catholics mm-hmm. I know are Catholics who may have been like you in in in, in high school or in college, right? Like uh, you know, a guy who's who's people who are I don't mean to, to, to belittle you. I mean that's mean it's insulting, but people who are in, who are Catholic in name but haven't really dug into their faith or take it too seriously for all kinds of reasons. Yeah. Those are the guys that people are seeing and going, look, the, the faith appeals to me, but I don't know any serious Catholics. Everyone I know is not taking it very seriously. So I love that what you're doing is you're showcasing these stories of people who are taking it seriously. Thank you. Right? These amazing stories, because those are stories that, that have to get, get out there, right? And hopefully inspire more people who who are Catholic take their faith more seriously too, right? And then that Absolutely. has a multiplying effect, hopefully. You know, I think I think of my own journey. I mean, I became evangelical around the time you were becoming nothing, <laughs> around grade 10 or so. I became evangelical Christian out of a kind of a nominal background. And I was I was big in the punk scene back then, right? In mm. in, in Newmarket, Ontario. Another big, another big, you know, bustling metropolis. <laughs> And, and, and for me, honestly, the Catholics that I knew at that time were the guys who could get the best drugs. They'd come in their uniforms after school from Catholic high school, come to the punk shows on a Friday night in their uniforms, just right from school. And they had the best drugs. They were the guys who were out back smoking. I had smuggled beer into the, into the, into the, uh, the Lions Club or whatever out back. And they were having a cigarette and a beer out back behind the club well, you know, in between sets. And that for me was... At that point, the example of the Catholics that I knew. So when I was digging deeper into my faith in university and and kind of doing more studying and taking it seriously, reading scriptures and being part of all kinds of different groups and 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 a vibrant student church, what I knew about, about Catholics was this: these Catholics, right? These guys who never took it seriously. And then I met more Catholics at, at my evangelical church who were ex-Catholics, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. I was Catholic, but I didn't know Jesus. I didn't learn anything, so I became, you know, non-denominational evangelical Christian, and that's that's who I am now. And I and now I know Jesus, and now I and that that was. And when the more I actually dug into those kind of stories and began to to look into the church and read Catholic things and began to actually meet some Catholics who took this seriously, I realized, wait a minute. A lot of this is misconceptions. A lot of the, a lot of these people that I met didn't actually know their faith back then either, right? They left the Catholic Church. Maybe they were raised Catholic. They left that, but didn't really know what they were doing as a Catholic. Didn't really know their faith. And what they're leaving isn't really, isn't really the faith. But but you know stories like like yours and stuff on, that that you do, are showcasing people that maybe went went through that, but now are taking the faith seriously, and digging into it. Right, mm-hmm. so I wonder. Like, I mean, I, I guess my my long winded way into that question, into this question, would be, like, what makes that well, that that difference? Like, is there something that takes somebody from a place of nominal Catholicism, you know, fa- going through the motions, going to mass, receiving the sacraments once in a while, to to taking that faith more seriously? Is there, is there a common denominator that you see that, in these stories that you, that you mm, tell? That's a good question. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is Revelation 3.20, where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Yeah, that's good. And the desire of Jesus to be in relationship uh, with that person. And what I would say is that, you know, yes, I was very much going through the motions as a young Catholic, but... I, I don't think I really had the opportunity to open wide that door to Jesus. You know, I think about St. John Paul II saying to millions and millions of young people, dear young people, do not be afraid. Open wide the doors to Christ. You know, and I think that when we truly decide to give that yes, you know, and, and it's not this one time yes, but it's actually mirroring Our Lady's fiat. 
let it be. Let it be done unto me according to thy word, right? Giving the Lord permission to move, not my will, but thy will be done, right? And I think that if you listen to people who are truly striving to live this out, and again, we're not perfect. Like, I'm not going to, I'm going to be completely honest and say I'm still a mess, but I know whose mess <laughs> I am, right? Like, I went to confession like last That's week. I'm still journeying with the Lord, but he constantly is, is, saying to me, you know, like, I'm like, I can't do this. I'm still a mess, you know, and he says, but I can, you know, and you, so you get up and you keep walking. And I think that when you open wide that door to Christ and you say yes, and you give Jesus permission, you encounter his love in a, in a way that you have not before. I mean, for me personally, after I opened that door, Joe Ferris gave me that invitation to open, opening wide that door going to mass all of a sudden it was like a light switch came on for me yeah and the psalms that i was deaf to all of a sudden the psalms were beautiful and were speaking into my life the readings were speaking directly to me i'm like are they following me like do they know like <laughs> the mass readings were just speaking directly into my situations and it's almost just like you're, you're seeing 2020 vision now but i think it's through that that yes, that yes, yeah. That giving of permission, yeah. And that's scary. So, I mean, for the person too who's who's listening to this, like, I mean, your story is uh, is undeniably crazy. It's it's an awesome story. Right? Thank so you. Somebody, <laughs> so somebody, <laughs> somebody from the outside who is looking at the Catholic faith, going, "Are there serious Catholics? You know, can I trust God to to abandon myself and jump into this weird Catholic church thing?" With the hangups I have, with the, with not being so sure that this is maybe the right the right move, you know, stories like yours say, yeah, you know what, you can you can say yes to Christ and look, there's a place for you here. I, I think, I think that's a good a great comfort for people, right? To know that, right? You 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 don't have to have it all figured out to. You know, to, to follow Christ in any sense, whether you're, you're a, a cradle Catholic, a new Catholic, or somebody who, who is just trying to follow Christ where he leads, and you find yourself listening to a, a, a podcast like this going, I, I think I might be becoming Catholic, but I'm, but I'm terrified. These stories, these stories just demonstrate that God can be trusted, even if you're not sure. And, and, not perfect, right? This is the cordial Catholic. I am. It's an aspirational title. I always say. You ask. You ask my wife, David. I'm not the cordial Catholic. <laughs> I am, on a, on a good day, on a good day, I'm working with my therapist to improve to improve how I treat others. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not there yet. Yeah. Right? But 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 God is faithful in our mm -hmm. lives if we if we say yes, right? No matter where we are on these on these these terrifying journeys, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I, and I think it's important to point out as well is that um, I went through my own journey. I mean, for the sake of time, I, I didn't really get into it, but I also was in my own journey of, you know, I also met other people on campus when I went back to my fourth year, I was looking for a community and there was a non-denominational group on campus where I was attending a Bible study and they really helped me grow in my faith. And so I was, put on this journey of, Lord, where do you want me to go? I was trying to constantly seek his will, but the thing that I kept going back to is either Jesus Christ is present in the Eucharist or he's not. Yeah, yes. And I could not ignore the fact that I truly encountered him, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. And it's it's like that scene of, of Peter where Jesus turns to him and says, are you going to leave too? And, and Peter says those words of, Lord, where would we go? Yeah. You have the words of eternal life. Yeah. I, I, we, we're both Canadians, so I can tell this story, and, and you'll get it, whether listeners to the show get it or not, David. I, I don't know, but I had a listener, I mean, last night. This is, of course, God's providence, right? Uh, kind of a joke at this point. It's, it's, so, it's so funny how these things work out. Last night, a listener emailed me asking me, you know, questions, and, and, and one of the questions that they asked was, look, I feel like I'm on the doorstep of becoming Catholic, but I'm not sure how I know when I can make the leap, essentially, when I can say yes to becoming Catholic. That's pretty funny. And I said to her, I, I said, look, for me, for me, the point was one night, uh, cooling a pot of soup 
in the snow. Which of course, when you're in Canada, you have some, you had some snow up here, and I had, a, I was making some soup, and I had to, I had a hot pot of boiled vegetables, I had to blend, I wanted to cool it down first before putting it into the blender, and so I'm standing out my back deck in my slippers, <laughs> and my, you know, and my, and my, and my, my jogging pants or something, my track pants, uh, cooling a pot of, of soup in a snowbank out behind our house. And I was reflecting on the journey I'd been on at that point. I, you know, I'd, I'd read a bunch of books, probably a couple dozen books at that point. I'd, I'd binged hours of The Journey Home on YouTube, uh, which is an awesome show of, of conversion stories. Yeah. I, had, I had watched two full hours of the RCAA course from Our Lady of Good Counsel in Plymouth, Michigan. Uh, Father Ricardo, who I've met and, and, and thanked him for taking his, his, uh, his course, he kind of went, what do you mean? You're from Canada. How did you take my course? And I said... It's all online. He said, oh, I didn't even know. So, you know, two years worth of the videos, I, I watched all this stuff. And I was, I was at the point myself, you know, with the, the, the pot of soup cooling the snowbank there thinking, where, you know, do I know enough to become Catholic or, or should I, or do I not? And like you say, the words of, of St. Peter echoed in my head. You know, where mm. else, where else can I go? Wow. Where, right. And I thought, yeah, you know what, and that was for me the turning point. I said, did you, you know feel what? the I, Lord's? Pre- did you feel the Lord's presence in that moment? In the, he was in the snowbank. I think. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I did. You know, I did. It was a powerful. It was a powerful moment for me mm. in that conversion experience, right? Mm. And and I've had lots of those experiences before that, and, and since where it's just it's it's palpable, right? Yeah. But but again, like, I mean, what is the irony? The 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 beautiful grace of God that just last night I had this email, and you mentioned this this the same verse for you and and how that is you know that that's a pivotal question and for me it was too it was i i knew i knew so much on my journey about the catholic faith I, I, that again like you know christ in the eucharist i was convinced of that at this point and i realized you know i can't go anywhere else i yes. i don't necessarily have all the answers i don't have everything figured out i didn't have mary figured out at that point i didn't mm-hmm. have purgatory figured out or the, or, the, or the saints figured out they didn't have it all figured out but i knew i knew too much to go back right. i knew that there was only one place i could go and that was forward yeah right so i ended up calling up the lo- the, the closest catholic parish and signing up for a rca course uh ended up being a really hilarious parish very sleepy and old and they used to wheel at the vhs the, the, wheel at the tv and put in the vhs tape this is 20, on the rolling cart? Yeah, on the rolling cart. Beautiful. It was 2014, so, I mean, the VHS had been long, at that point, long long past its prime, but right. here we go. And uh, and telling my wife was a, also a journey, uh, because I, I hadn't really kept her abreast of my, my thinking up to that point. Mm. Uh, but well, we worked it out, and we, we have a wonderful Catholic <laughs> marriage now. Praise God. David, but, you know, it's, it's those... Those inflection points, right? those, those moments of grace, those moments of, of God reaching down, right? And, 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 and through that, that palpable presence where we, where we say yes, or I don't know, turn away or, or, or ignore that. But I think that that can't be ignored for too long mm-hmm. <laughs> at our own peril. I mean, like you say, God's knocking and he, and he, and he keeps knocking, right? And I think it's an invitation. Anything, yeah. Yeah, if anything you and I know is that he is going to keep knocking. He, he wants that. He wants that for us. He wants that closeness. And it's just us, right? It's, it's us with our hand on the door keeping it closed. It's not, it's not God. Mm. He's there. As soon as that door opens an inch, right? That, that love floods in, mm-hmm. right? right? And how do, you, how do you truly get closer than that moment of receiving the Eucharist where it's the yeah. blood of the King flowing through your yeah. veins, you know, yeah. like it's, it truly is incredible. And I think, I think even that moment of Catholics, when you receive Jesus in the Eucharist, to take that moment wow. and recognize what's happening right now, yeah. that sanctifying grace that is being poured out is powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I think let's, let's dig in there for a minute because, I mean, that, that, that's... You take it for granted sometimes, like you, you, you forget that or don't, don't feel the full weight of that sometimes, right? As a, as a Catholic, even as a convert myself, you don't feel mm-hmm. that, that weight. You know, we're at mass with three kids and they're being a bit crazy <laughs> yep. as they do, right? And we're, we're trying our best to be plugged in and, and, and be part of it and, and respect, be, be reverent and be focused and, be, and, and receive the Eucharist well. But you don't always, you know, it, 
things get in the way. Definitely. But but to sit back and and feel the full weight of that is enormous. I mean, I can, I I. I'm new enough in the church to remember or still have the feeling of the first time I, I went to adoration. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, this is a beautiful, for all its sleepiness and the VHS tapes, <laughs> the, the, the yeah. parish church that I was uh, uh, you know, confirmed in and received into the church in right. was a beautiful old church from the 1850s or something, okay. be- beautifully done and maintained inside. I mean, the candles were all electric. They'd changed those in like the 50s, which is a little bit lame, but everything else was still <laughs> quite nice and beautiful. And to walk in there on a Friday and to smell the smell of incense and to see the monsters up on the altar and to have nobody else, I mean, one other person in, in the church, and to walk down the creaky floor all the way to the front and to kneel down and to feel that palpable presence of Christ in the Eucharist, mm-hmm. I, I could not deny that something was going on there. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could psychologize about what that could have, I mean, I could have just been imagining that or had that ramped in my head up, but there's something in that that I don't think I could muster for myself or describe you know, even in, even as I try to <laughs> try to now, mm-hmm. there's some there, there's something powerful in that, and and that is the that is the 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 reply where where else can I go, right? That's where that comes from. Where else can I go to experience that? Like if that that closeness is is impossible, I mean, to imagine or to or to obtain outside of that relationship, right? Like that's yeah. It, you brought back a memory of being a youth minister at the at the Catholic Church, and during Holy Week, they actually removed the Eucharist from the tabernacle. But I, at the time, like I was still learning my Catholic faith day by day, and I remember I walked in the church, and Father was there, and I said, "Father, something is like off," <laughs> and he pointed to the tabernacle that was empty, and I went, "Whoa, wow." You know, and it's funny because I work uh, at a Catholic high school, and even today, I was in the chapel. And a student looked at me and said, sir, the vibes in here are incredible. <laughs> and it's like, you know, I don't know where they're at in their in their faith journey, but they they recognize a difference. And and the difference is Jesus, that Jesus is truly present in, in the tabernacle. And I think one of the most powerful moments that I had is I met with a priest and he encouraged me to actually go and kneel down right at the feet of Jesus, as close as you could get to Jesus in the Eucharist. And to just simply look at Jesus and say, Jesus, I want you to show me right now how you see me. He said, you close your eyes and you don't move until he shows you. And he said that he was on Ignatian uh, spirituality retreats. And he said he saw like grown men that are like football players, like just sobbing (laughs) because the Lord was communicating his love to them in a very real way. And I got I to gotta say that that moment, I mean, I was intrigued after I had that meeting with Father that I went directly to adoration. I was like, all right, Jesus, you and me. <laughs> and I just asked that question. And, and he basically communicated that I was a son, that I was beloved, you know, and yeah, I was going to stumble and fall, but he was a, he's a good father who wants to pick his children up when they fall and encourage them on the journey. <laughs> That's amazing. That's that's awesome, and you mentioned too before in your journey reconciliation, confession, right? Yeah. The, the power of that. That again is one of those remarkable ways that you know that Christ shows us He loves us, yes. and 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 shows us mercy. I mean, I don't know what I expected that to be like before I became Catholic, but it's mm-hmm. surpassed my expectation. I mean, I know why well, I should say I knew I was terrified of it. I was terrified to have to go for the first time at least and confess my sins to a person. Like that was humbling. That was, that was crazy. Right. I thought well, I, I can't, I can't do that. Yes. Those are, I, I, one thing to pray in my bedroom by myself with Jesus and say, I'm sorry for this, 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 and the other thing here, but to go ahead and tell a person that was like, no, I can't, I can't, I can't do that. But once I got over that hang up, Right. Yeah. Once I began to understand that, yeah, it's a person. He is, he is person in Christ. Like he is, he is standing in in a very real sense mm-hmm. for Jesus there, and quite literally, the, the words that the priest says are words that Christ put on his lips to, to say. Right. It's deeply scriptural. It's it's deeply yes. it's it's incredible, and I can remember. You know, I I, I not my first confession experience, but. 
a couple speeches after that, we had a, an amazing priest from Ghana, I think, visiting our visiting our parish, and <laughs> go for a Saturday afternoon confession at the, at the at the parish, and the person who came out from the confessional ahead of me as I'm waiting turns to me and says, "I don't know who's in there, man, but that was like insane. <laughs> you get you got to get in there." <laughs> Right. So I go in. So I go in and I, I give my confession, and it was a revival. It was like a revival mm-hmm. meeting in that confessional, mm-hmm. because the, the, this priest just quoted scripture over me, and to explain how, okay, you know, he 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 said the prayers. He per, he performed you know, the, the rite of uh, of reconciliation, but his words to me. In between, like, you know, the, the advice the priest can give you to say, you know, the pastoral advice was just like quoting scripture over me, how God loves me. I'm, I'm beloved. I'm his son. You know, this, yes. I, I, I will be forgiven and I'll, I'll go forward and I'll do amazing things. And oh, it was, a, it was an amazing experience. And I left there forgiven and just, <laughs> you know, vibrating, like just buzzing from this experience of, of God's palpable grace and mercy and forgiveness and and even in times i guess when it's not like a revival in there right because it won't it won't it often won't be i don't think you still leave with that feeling that tangible feeling that that can't be had elsewhere i don't think yeah of of forgiveness of Mm -hmm. being set back on a right path and that god loves you and you realize too why that makes sense why confessing to a person then makes so much more sense than how I used to do it as a, as a, a Protestant in my, in my bedroom when, when I had to kind of hope God heard me and feel forgiven versus a priest saying to you, I have the power that Christ gave me in, his, in establishing this church to say this to you and you are, you are forgiven and, and believe that. And that's like, that's next level powerful, right? <laughs> I was thinking about that the other day of, I don't know another church that, that claims um, to echo Jesus' words of whatever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. And whatever sins you retain, they are retained. Yeah. Who else claims that? Yeah. If you know, please send me a DM or email me because <laughs> I'm not sure. But it's interesting because I had a similar um, revival experience in confession. I said, you know, when I asked Jesus, I want you to show me how you see me. I had this image of my, my little boy running and stumbling. Right. And in that moment, I just wanted to run to him and pick him up and just say, you know, I love you. It's okay. And what was so incredible is I was in confession and I had a priest from Africa who was just such an incredible, faithful man of God. And he looked me right in the eyes and he said, brother, when a child is learning to walk and they fall as a parent, you scold them, but you say, no, get up, try again. He said, and as they get up and try again, they're no longer wobbling along, but they're, they're then walking and then they're running. And he said, so too in our spiritual life. He said, you get up, you keep walking and trust that Jesus is with you. And like, he didn't know any of that, that image for me that God has communicated to me. <laughs> it's just amazing how the Holy Spirit moves. Yeah, It truly is incredible. Yeah, that's, a, that's amazing. So somebody who is, who is skeptical of this whole thing, who, you know, who's, who's unsure, who's, who's frightened or, or me this way, who's hurt by say faith. Who's like, mm-hmm. you know what, David, I, I hear you guys telling these stories, but I'm suffering. I've, I've suffered. I've suffered at the hands of the church in some cases. Right. And as heartbreaking as that is, that that's not uncommon. Right. Even as a convert, I have my own, scandal of stories of how the church wounded our family mm-hmm. and we're pretty new Catholics. So it's disappointing. It, it sucks, but it's out there, right? People who are wounded by the church, who are wounded by faith in general, who are wounded by, who are wounded by Christianity writ large, but even wounded by the, the, the Catholic church in, mm-hmm. in particular, who, who are maybe nervous to say yes to, to digging deeper who have these roadblocks, who might say, you know what, I, I, I don't think that there is a reason to say yes, because all I see is suffering, or I've said yes before in the past, and I've, I've been hurt, I've been wounded, I, I, you know, I can't do it again. You've heard a lot of stories, you have a remarkable story. Somebody who is suffering, who has suffered, 
what, I mean, this is, maybe this is a big ask for me to ask you to put you on the spot to ask this, but what do you say to a person who's in that place to encourage them to give it uh, another chance, to give it a chance to begin with, to, to really give it a good go, despite the hurt and pain and, and woundedness and brokenness? What would you say to a person like that? That's a beautiful question, but I think it's the question of suffering that I'm still trying to wrap my head around <laughs> personally. I have no idea. Yes, that's a good uh, answer, yeah. It's not that I have no idea. I mean, I have some thoughts, but it's it's a big ask, right? It um, is. Because people's pain is real. Yeah. But I think about um, the Chronicles of Narnia with C.S. Lewis and... I believe it's in the magician's nephew where the little boy cries out to Aslan and in his pain, he just in desperation cries out to Aslan and says, why can't you just make my mother better? There's a lot of pain there. Right. Yeah. And in that moment, CS Lewis explains that at this point he was looking at Aslan's paws, but in that moment of desperation, he actually looked up and Aslan is significant of Christ, is symbolic of Christ, right? He looked up and in Aslan's eyes, he saw these bright tears where for a moment, he almost thought that Aslan was actually more sorry for his mother's suffering than he was. And this idea that Jesus is with us in our pain He's with us in our suffering. And I think that act of surrender, even in the midst of those crosses and those pains that we have endured, I always hold on to the fact that God always has the last day with all things. Because in Revelation, we have that promise where he says, behold, I am making all things new. I've gone through pain with the church myself. I'm not going to get into it tonight. <laughs> but um, I truly believe that God is in control. And um, I think all that God asks is that we try. That's a good answer. <laughs> That's good. That's a good word. Okay, maybe one, one or two more things. And one of these things is, okay, so if you had to pitch saying yes to Catholicism to somebody who is who is Christian, who is digging deep in their faith, who is not yet Catholic and kind of looking at the faith from, from the outside. I mean, the Eucharist is a good place to start, I think. Adoration, sure. I would highly recommend. Is that where you'd start for somebody who's, who's I, looking I mean, to... Because we can suggest books all day long, right? You could. And, yep. and books are good. I and mean, I read my way into the church in large, in large part. But there's a place for the heart, though, right? There's a place for that that move into the spirit. So adoration is where you'd start? Well, and, and that's what I actually offer at our, at our high school on a monthly basis is I will, don't judge me for this, but during the lunch hour, I will actually <laughs> stand out in the hall and I will hand students little, little stones. Uh, and I basically will, will hand them that stone and I'll say, uh, you got burdens, you got stuff going on. And every single person is like, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Once the very first student that I ever passed the rock to, the, the girl said, sir, could I have a boulder? Because that would be the equivalent of what I've got going on right now. And I basically have a little uh, basket that's positioned right at the feet of Jesus. And I basically say, as Catholics, we believe that Jesus is truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. And uh, as alive as I am in front of you right now, I believe that Jesus is in that chapel. And this is an opportunity for you to go and kneel and lay your burdens at his feet. And once you say, Jesus, I can't carry this anymore. I'm giving it to you. And you lay that rock down as a way of surrendering it to him. I invite you to look at Jesus in the Eucharist and just simply say these words, Jesus, I want you to show me right now how much you love me. And I actually tell them, if you get distracted, picture yourself in front of this door and that you're opening that door. And you say, Jesus, I want you to come into my life. And the encounters that these young people have had, Pentecostal, non-denominational, Catholic, right? Like Jesus moves in those, in those moments. It's a simple invitation of, of God being able to move. And I think 
you know, I think of St. Jose Maria Scriven. I'll actually say this to the students after the fact. When they walk out, you can see the change in their face, right? They, they had an opportunity to literally kneel like Mary, to sit at the Lord's feet and listen to him speak, right? You can see the change in their face. And, and in that moment, I'll tell them, St. Jose Maria Scriva says that, remember that when you approach the tabernacle, when you approach Jesus in the Eucharist, basically, that he's been waiting 21 centuries for you. <laughs> wow. Right? That moment yeah. with God. And so um, for me personally, it's the Eucharist that I cling to because I truly, with all of my being, believe that he has not left us. I mean, Matthew 28, he, he has given us that promise. Behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. He has not left us. He is present in every single tabernacle across the entire world, universal Catholic church. And I can't think of a better place to, to go. Where else would we go? <laughs> yeah. Amen. That's amazing. You know, I think of how, how things, I mean, this conversation is, is a lot about how these stories intertwine and how God, the, you know, God orchestrates these things and it's beautiful. And I, and I love it. And I think again of the guy who introduced me to you and his impact in my life. I mean, here I was, a no, you know, nominally, whatever. We, we weren't, we were, I guess we were Christian, but we weren't really practicing as a family. And when I began asking those kind of questions about life and the, and the universe, the meaning of things, and about grade 10-ish, he was a guy that I went to. Mm. And he never, I'd known him since I was two. And I never, you know, we never talked about faith or religion or Jesus or anything like that, the Bible. But this was a guy that I knew was busy on Sundays. You know, we, we couldn't hang out Sunday mornings, in, you know, Sunday until about two o'clock or so, because he was busy. I knew he was at church, right? And when I went to his house, it was a, a peaceful place because something was different about it, right? And, and, when, and when his parents interacted with him, it was, it was, it was different. But we never, he never evangelized me. He never talked about Jesus or anything. But I knew he was a Christian. And so when I had questions, when I wanted to know things about the universe and what to believe and, and if there's a God out there and these, these big questions, I went to him. Mm -hmm. And I always think about this, David, that he never spoke to me. He never evangelized me in, in the way that we'd call evangelization right? He didn't get in the street corner with the Bible and was yelling things at me or trying to give me tracks in my like lunch bag or something at school. He just lived his life. Mm -hmm. And I knew he was a Christian. And when I had questions, I went to him. Mm -hmm. And I always think of that, how powerful that is. And I try to apply that lesson all these years later, right, to my own life. And I think of guys like you and stories that you have on your show. And like, you know, people, like we're just two guys trying to live as Catholics, for our families, like for our neighbors in, in the world, just trying to follow Christ as best we can. And, and we, I mess up all the time. <laughs> I'm, I'm terrible. Welcome to the club, I'm man. I'm a terrible Catholic <laughs> most of the time, right? But I think, okay, but what do people see? Like, will there, am I living my life saying yes to Christ, saying yes to the Catholic faith enough that when somebody has a question, they know, oh yeah, there's the Catholic guy. I'm going to ask him. You know, like, who's God going to bring into my life that will see me and know by how I live that, I, that I'm a guy who could answer questions or could help them, them find things or help them on their path, right? It's not about necessarily preaching from the street corner all the time, right? It's about living that, that Catholic life, just saying yes every day. Yes. Right? <laughs> yes. Saying that, yes. And, and that's what I'm saying is, is giving that giving that permission for for Jesus to move in your life, rolling out the red carpet to the Holy Spirit saying, Lord, whoever you want me to talk to today, yeah. I say yes to you. Wherever you want me to go today, I say yes to you. I'll give you one quick example that's that's just, it still blows my mind to this day. I was, I gave my yes on my way to work. And that morning I ran into a teacher and I stopped them and I said, do you know how long it took the Israelites to get to the promised land? And when I said it, I was thinking to myself, like, why are you bringing this up? You crazy person. <laughs> what are you talking about? And the teacher goes, no. And I said, 40 <laughs> years. And I said, do you know how long it was supposed to take them? Right? Because it was supposed to be a 40 day journey, but it took them 40 years. She's like, well, then what took them so long? 
And I said, they were going in circles. They weren't listening to God. The teacher looked at me like a deer in the headlights. And she said, we need to go to your office right now. And I was like, okay. Like I was so confused. She sits me down and she said, today on my way to work was the first time I talked out loud to God in my car. And I said, okay, what'd you say? And she said, God, I feel like I'm going in circles. You have to give me a sign today. Wow. And I was like, well, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> right. But that That's I, I simply said, yeah. yes, I simply yeah. gave permission yep. and he used it. And and that teacher went to confession after I think 16, 16 years of being wow. away, you know? And so, um, we, we can all give that yes, that fiat every day. And I'm telling you right now, you give that yes every single day to Jesus and you will know what miracles are. Yeah. 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 And you're not wrong, man. <laughs> you're not wrong. Listeners to this show who followed this for a bit know that we, as a family, made a huge move recently, you know, six months or so ago. Uh, and it was following a crazy idea we had, right? That, that wow. God planted a lie. We said yes, and I quit my job. We sold our house. We waited. It was crazy. And I sometimes think, I mean, everything was worked out in miraculous fashion. I mean, we couldn't have planned how this has all worked out for us. It's been amazing. It's been a, a, a year of miracles for us beyond our wildest imaginations. And I, I think sometimes, what do others see from our yes? Like I, I, I quit my job of 15 years and people went, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> aren't you crazy? Like what, what's the plan here? And I think on the end of this right now where we are, we're not, this isn't the end, but again, those glimpses we see sometimes of, of, of of the grace God gives and the plan he has for us. I feel like we're in a place in our family that we can see the path a little bit and it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And I think what do people who've now seen us go from there to here and how things just worked out amazingly, what do they think? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, cause I like to think that our yes to God has shown others who are watching, well, look what God can do when you say yes. Look at these guys who, who sold their house and, and quit, quit his job and look at them now they're, they're doing amazing. They, He's got a job. He's, they have an amazing house. It's a, God, God has blessed us enormously in this, in this move we've made. And I like to think that our saying yes every single day as best we can, and oftentimes no, because I'm, I'm not that great of a Catholic in the end of things, right? And I'm often, my, often my yes is a very half-hearted yes and, and not the yes it should be, right? If we're being honest. It's being human. But I like to think that our story shows something of God's grace and power. And somebody looking at that story will go, wow, look at that. Maybe God's got something going on here. Maybe he's worth checking out or, or, or you know, going back to confession after 16 years because, right? Because you said yes and, and that opportunity opened itself up. I mean. But let's be honest, that. though. Like, yes, <laughs> there is incredible graces, but there is also a lot of redemptive suffering that we can't yeah. ignore. I mean, Jesus said, yeah pick up your cross daily and follow me, right? That is a journey. And, and yes, there's, there's much grace, but there is also suffering. Yeah. Um, but, but again, realizing that Jesus has taken all of it on the cross, that he's with us in our suffering, that he's never left us. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Well, David, it's been awesome chatting with you. I appreciate fun, your time. Man. It's, I, I love it. I love these kinds of conversations. Where can people go if they don't know who you are already, which I doubt they don't know who you are. Your, your work is awesome, and I love it, and hopefully they already know all about you. If they somehow don't, where do you want to point them towards? Where can they go? Where can they see your stuff? Where can they tune in live? I, I sometimes catch you live, and I wish I caught you live more often. I, I, I'll, I'll watch your stuff often after the fact as, it, you know, as I can get it. But occasionally I'm like, oh, yeah, this is it. There's your mom in the, in the chat, <laughs> loving on it. No. Where can they go to find your stuff, David? Yeah, I think uh, if you want to check out Instagram, uh, you can follow at yes.catholic. You can also visit our website, uh, www.yescatholic.com. And all the stories are now being uploaded as a podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts as well. So I think that's the best place to go. That's awesome. How many stories have you, have you, did you catch that? It's almost reaching 200 now. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And it's all grace. I mean, it's awesome stuff hearing these stories. And I'm sure for you hearing them week after week, it's amazing. 
I mean, it's amazing how if, gosh, if people are, are want to deny that God is working in the world, I mean, it gets harder and harder <laughs> listening to your podcast and watching, watching your stuff. I feel like yeah. these undeniable stories of grace, it's amazing. So it, Yeah. It's yeah. and, and it's so amazing because even me, right? Like I'm on my own journey. Yeah. And sometimes when I'm struggling in my in my walk with the Lord, I'll be like, Welcome to Yes Catholic, you know? But then <laughs> when people start sharing their story, I'm literally just sitting there saying, Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. You are speaking directly to my heart right now. Absolutely. You know, and it's just amazing God's grace. That's awesome. Well, thanks for being here, uh, David. I want to say God bless you and the awesome work you're doing for the church. Thank you. And uh Thanks so much. Thanks, brother.